Good morning. I want to uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, we have a really good crowd. Uh, my name is Bob Perito. I'm the director of the Security Sector Governance Program here at USIP. And uh, it's my high honor to introduce the Executive Vice President of the U.S. Institute of Peace, Tara Sonnenschein. Thank you and good morning. I'm amazed to look out at 10 o'clock in the morning and all of these incredible experts. Um, it's not the sexiest title of a topic. So when I see that we're doing the first meeting of the Security Sector Governance Working Group, I think, ooh, can we compete with all that's out there? But obviously um, those in the room and those joining us online recognize really the significance and the, the vital role that this issue plays in everything that we all do related to fragile states and conflict zones. And so I want to begin by thanking Bob for organizing this and putting it together. Um, you're part of a very exciting venture because within the Institute we have decided that this topic of security sector governance needs to be elevated and really made significant. And I see some heads shaking. So um, we're going to make this um, early next year part of a, a real center of innovation and really begin to convene and network and put this subject on the map. The work you're doing is critical, and we understand that this is something that requires our energies, our resources, our research, and our talents. Um, so I am really delighted, and I also want to thank DOD for its ongoing contributions to this program, which enables us to elevate it um, to a central part of our center. Um, I don't need to tell all of you that in May 2010, President Obama said in the National Security Strategy, um, specifically on page 27 of that document, that the United States must improve its ability to strengthen the capacity of states at risk of conflict by improving their security forces and the institutions providing administrative oversight while promoting respect for human rights and the rule of law. We followed that up a month later uh, with an international conference that really looked at the state of the art for reforming institutions responsible for supervising this whole security sector in conflict states. There were many representatives for that event from the UN, NGOs, regional organizations, governments, research <coughs> institutes. And out of that work, today's meeting considers one of the key products from that conference, and that's the USIP special report by one of our guests, Greg Hermsmeyer. It's on U.S. approaches to security sector reform. I had a chance to review it in its early stage, and it is a first-class document. So I think you're going to enjoy hearing more about that and more about our distinguished panel of experts convened today on this subject. Very delighted that Karen could make time to come over. It's not easy to get out of the daily grind, uh, to have a little time to reflect, and I'm grateful to our other experts and guests, and grateful really to Bob Perito for putting this together, and so I turn it respectfully back to our moderator. Thank you so much for all being here. Thank you very much, Tara, and thank you for being with us this morning. Um, I just want to draw attention to two reports that are on the table outside. Uh, as Tara mentioned, we have Greg Hermsmeyer's new report called Institutionalizing Security Sector Reform, and um, another one by Eric Shea called Realism and Pragmatism in Security Sector Development. This is sort of an in, more like an interpretive essay on the current state of, uh, of the concept of uh, security sector governance. So. Two brand new reports, I think, really interesting reading. Uh, the concept of security sector reform is based on the linkage between security, good governance, and development. These positive end states are achieved through the theory 
or under the theory through a whole of government approach that brings together the talents, expertise, and energy of a range of agencies. This approach has been endorsed in U.S. government pronouncements, but seldom in practice. In Iraq and Afghanistan, under pressure, the U.S. has reverted to train and equip programs conducted by a single agency or directed by a single agency, the Department of Defense. Recently, the administration has produced a series of new policy documents, the National Security Strategy, the Presidential, Doc Presidential Directive on Global Development, and hopefully in the near future, the QDDR. Um, so the question is, will these new documents change the way the U.S. conducts security sector assistance and promote security sector reform? This morning, we have a very distinguished panel of experts to address this and related questions. You all have their bios, so I will dispense with long, involved introductions, but I will uh, introduce them briefly in the order that they will speak, and I'll ask them to come up to the podium uh, so that, uh, because it works much better with the camera in the back. Uh, we are um, online uh, today. Uh, there is an active chat uh, going on for people that are watching this um, literally around the country and around the globe, and we will be uh, interfacing with the people who are, who are with us online, and they will be able to ask questions at the end. Um, our first speaker this morning is Colonel Greg Hermsmeyer, who recently retired from the United States Air Force. His last assignment was Director of Partnership Policy and Strategy in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. As you can see when you read, as you will see or have seen in reading Greg's report, uh, he has an insider's view and an encyclopedic knowledge of the U.S. government's organizations and practice in SSR. Our second speaker is Karen Hanrahan, who is the director of the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. Uh, as you heard already, she's one of the busiest people in Washington today, and we are very grateful that she's taken the time to be here this morning. Uh, our third speaker, Julie Warble, is um, the senior security advisor on security reform for the U.S. Agency for International Development, probably the most knowledgeable person, um, and that's saying something, uh, on the panel this morning in terms of, of the breadth of her knowledge and her involvement with this topic. And we're again grateful for Julie to be here. And finally, uh, William Dirch, uh, Senior Associate and Director of the Future of Peace Operations Program at the Stimson Center. Stimson has worked on SSR programs for the United Nations. Bill is a keen observer of Washington, and we've asked him to listen to the other presentations and draw upon his uh, considerable background in this area to provide us with observations and comments. So it should be a lively morning. Uh, when we're finished, we'll open the floor to uh, questions and discussion. Uh, this is a very distinguished group of folks this morning. We're grateful you're here, and so let's begin. Great. Good morning, and uh, thanks to U.S. Institute of Peace for the opportunity to publish the report, as well as to speak to you today with uh, such esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, thanks especially to Bob Perito, who's been a good friend and partner in moving the uh, SSR agenda forward over the last three years or so that we've worked together. I'm going to start out today by uh, explaining why I wrote the report and what I hope to achieve with it before I get into some of the report specifics. As Bob mentioned, I worked uh, before I retired uh, from the military in OSD policy. I was there for about four years and worked on a number of initiatives involving uh, stability operations, building partner capacity, uh, security assistance, security cooperation, and uh, those included running the Section 1207 uh, security and stabilization program within DOD, and the advancing DOD's legislative and budget agenda uh, uh, for authorities and resources on the Hill. I was also responsible for, for SSR policy. And in SSR, I found uh, a common thread that linked together most of my work uh, uh, conceptually for the first time. And one of the highlights of my time in OST involved uh, working with the grassroots efforts to put SSR on the U.S. Uh, government policy agenda uh, by an informal SSR working group members are well represented here today, and uh, Julie Werbel and uh, other key contributors I see around the audience. But regrettably, the working group lost some momentum after the uh, producing what I thought was a, a, a pinnacle uh, 3D security sector reform statement in uh, uh, January of 2009. And I regret that we never developed as a working group a vision for what a whole government approach to security sector reform uh, might look like. 
So that, the first purpose of my report was then to, to offer a vision of what a whole government framework uh, for SSR might look like and offer some options for getting there. The second purpose of uh, my report was to defend the, the use of the term reform in security sector reform. In the not too distant past, uh, the uh, security sector reform was often seen as a uh, set of donor-driven activities that uh, one country does to another country. Well, I think the key to the security sector reform concept is to see reform as, as something that a country does to itself, for itself, and sometimes with, with outside assistance. SSR offers a, a roadmap for change management as part of a broader democratic uh, process that is essential to good governance in any country. And I like to highlight uh, some, some very good examples within the U.S. government context. For instance, the 1986 Goldwater-Nichols Act reformed the military command structure. The reform of the U.S. intelligence sector under the Director of National Intelligence and the consolidation of border control, customs, coast guard, and other critical security functions under the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 are all examples of security sector reform works in progress in the U.S. context. So today the term SSR uh, is increasingly accepted by donors and aid recipients alike, as well as by the United Nations, which has uh, set up its own uh, SSR unit, and by the OECD, which has really led the charge in uh, keeping SSR on the international agenda. In the U.S. government, unfortunately, uh, SSR has become increasingly supplanted by a new term of art, security sector assistance. And SSR is recognized as one objective of security sector assistance, which includes a you know, broader set of activities, including you know, training and equipment and uh, support for U.S. allies and coalition partners for actual military operations. But the problem, as I see it, is that the current initiatives that center on security sector assistance, including one I'll talk to you about, about pooled funding, focus too much uh, on the way assistance is delivered, not enough on the desired ends of capacity and reform. And as somebody who's been closely associated with efforts to build partner capacity over the last few years, I would argue that reform, which involves transformation of individual attitudes and behaviors and relationships at the most basic level, is even more important at the end of the day than that capacity. Without reform, U.S. assistance risks being wasted, or worse, we risk building they're helping partners build more effective security forces that may not be bound by the rule of law, that may not be <coughs> legitimate in the eyes of local populations or sustainable in the long run. Well, so that now that I've made uh, my plug to remember the R and SSR, let me shift to some of the key points of the paper. Uh, to reach the vision for a whole of government approach to SSR, a number of key steps are needed in, in five areas or bins that I identify in the paper. Uh, those areas are interagency policy guidance, interagency assessment, planning, programming, and evaluation, flexible funding, interagency structures, and human capital. For the U.S. government to effectively support the transformation of a partner's uh, security sector, clear policy guidelines are needed. Common lexicon is needed for sharing, creating a shared understanding of terms and concepts among civilian and military stakeholders. Guidance is needed to help clarify organizational roles and missions and defining goals and objectives for assistance. The 3D SSR paper I mentioned was the first attempt uh, to offer such guidance, although it was never formally recognized as a, as a policy uh, statement. It was an important first step, and it directly informed a number of key documents and processes, uh, especially within DOD and its uh, planning documents. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was uh, limited to the 3Ds. It was only uh, signed out by the State Department, uh, DOD, and USAID. And also, it was uh, adopted, literally, in the last days of the Bush administration and did not rep uh, reflect the views of the new Obama administration. Fortunately, work is being done right now on a, a presidential policy directive uh, for security sector assistance. Uh, and when this is completed, this PPD would represent the position of the current Obama administration. And even more importantly, it would be directive and binding on all U.S. government agencies and departments, uh, not just the, the 3Ds. And uh, it will also hopefully define more clearly the roles, missions, and responsibilities of the organizations, as well as the uh, goals and objectives of uh, U.S. assistance uh, to our partners. Uh, while this step is uh, vitally important, you know, again, I would argue that uh, an opportunity will be missed if uh, the PPD does not emphasize the reform imperative, along with the need for more efficient delivery of security assistance. 
the second bin uh, that I offer is interagency assessment, planning, programming, and evaluation, which is a long way of saying strategic planning. I uh, wanted to call out each of the individual components because uh, we have strengths and weaknesses in each area. Ideally, uh, comprehensive needs assessments would provide the foundation for all U.S. government decisions on uh, programs and priorities uh, for assistance. And to be comprehensive, these assessments would also include, in addition to a look at operational capacity, an analysis of political context, political will of those in power, their incentives for change, the attitudes of uh, security providers, who the potential spoilers might be, and entry points for donors. A thorough needs assessment can help establish a baseline, which is critical for future programming as well as monitoring and evaluation. Without, you, without knowing uh, where you start from, you really can't measure progress uh, or impact very effectively. Unfortunately, assessment's a major deficiency in the international SSR community as well as uh, within our government. As a consequence, programs and activities are often developed without a thorough understanding of local uh, conditions and priorities and often end up being driven by donor supply rather than by local need. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the U.S. government has made some important contributions in this area in terms of tools and methodologies. Uh, Julie has helped to lead efforts to develop an interagency security sector assessment framework that's an overarching tool uh, that looks across the entire security sector. And other tools have been developed for sub-elements of the security sector, including a maritime SSR framework, the criminal justice sector assessment rating tool developed by a state INL, and is as of last Friday, uh, the Defense Sector Assessment Rating Tool, which was just released by, uh, by RAND uh, Corporation and was sponsored by the Department of Defense. So the next step is to systematize the use of these tools and other analytic uh, instruments to help establish baselines for follow-on plans and programs. So informed by a comprehensive assessment, the U.S. government should help partners design long-term national strategies and SSR programs and plans that are tailored to their unique context. Activities should then be prioritized and phased, resources aligned, and linkages made among security actors in an integrated plan of reform. Well, my focus in the paper and in my presentation is on SSR from a Washington uh, inside the Beltway perspective. It's important to remember that planning should support the activities uh, uh, and uh, expertise in the field and in the country team, as well as being responsive to top-down imperatives by uh, senior leaders in Washington. You know, finally, uh, planning should recognize that SSR is really a, a long-term process and, and should be viewed in terms of you know, multiple years or, or even decades uh, to come to fruition. In my experience, SSR planning, uh, unfortunately, tends to be reactive rather than preventative, and the responses depend uh, to a great extent on personalities for success. Planning processes generally feature more of a year-to-year -year rather than a long-term, multi-year perspective. And the U.S. government lacks a uh, clear process for determining uh, whole of government priorities and developing comprehensive plans for supporting SSR strategies. So one of my recommendations in the report is that the U.S. government build a framework, process, and procedures to jointly plan and program uh, SSR activities and build on existing planning frameworks, such as the mission strategic plans and the DOD uh, the combatant commanders, the theater campaign plans, and integrate uh, those uh, in a whole of government manner. Uh, evaluation is, uh, is, is critically important, but I, I think of all the elements, this is probably the most lacking. Uh, measuring the success and failure of SSR planning and programming is critical for making midterm adjustments uh, to plans and programs and evaluating whether assistance is having the desired impact and outcomes that uh, that were planned for. Uh, evaluation is also important to make sure uh, to assessing whether a program should be continued at all. Measurement is especially important in a time such as that we face now with uh, mounting resource constraints. Unfortunately, the lack of uh, systematic and meaningful evaluation of program impact may be the most glaring uh, deficiency among uh, the international SSR community. To the extent uh, evaluations performed at all, it tends to focus on outputs such as numbers of troops trained, numbers of dollars spent, you know, amounts of equipment uh, uh, purchased, rather than on the outcomes of those investments. Steps such as uh, DOD's recent effort to set up an Office of Security Cooperation Assessments are important steps in filling this gap, but they remain fairly modest in, in scale. So I recommend that the U.S. government stakeholders develop, you know, build on efforts such as the uh, DOD Office of Security Cooperation Assessments and leverage existing evaluation tools that have been developed by other 
SSR stakeholders, uh, such as uh, the Safer World uh, organization, and began a more systematic process of evaluation and effectiveness evaluate, uh, imp impact evaluations. And since I wrote the paper uh, in the last couple of weeks, the Office of Management and Budget has uh, put out guidance that calls for program evaluations across government and that establishes a $100 million fund to support managers who want to conduct evaluations of their own programs. So this is another uh, potential source of resources uh, for evaluating the impact of SSR funding. The fourth element I wanted to highlight is uh, flexible funding. As I mentioned earlier, much of the recent focus on security sector assistance has been on funding mechanisms available to decision makers and how uh, those should be aligned between uh, DOD and the State Department and how those might be made more effective. So off officials need to have access to sufficient funds. They also need access to sufficiently flexible funds. And in this case, quality of the funds and the mechanisms is as important as the quantity of the, of the dollars. A growing number of uh, governments, especially in the UK and uh, Canada, have established flexible cross-departmental programming instruments for SSR, as well as for broader uh, stabilization and conflict prevention missions. At their best, these instruments uh, actually incentivize coordination and result in more integrated programs and better outcomes of, uh, of activities. In recent years, DOD and, and State Department have sought new authorities, such as the Section 1206 uh, Global Train Equip Program and Section 1207 Security and Stabilization Program to help create more flexible and responsive tools for jointly addressing challenges. These have made, marked a major advance uh, in that they require projects for the first time to be jointly uh, formulated and approved by both secretaries. Well, as many of you know, uh, Secretary Gates last year pr uh, proposed to Secretary Clinton uh, adopting the UK's pooled funding mechanism and approach to the US government context as a, as a step to help institutionalize these dual key authorities like 1206 and 1207 and to move to the next level. An interagency working group has been working on that proposal over the summer, uh, but it remains unclear what shape the final proposal will take and when that will be uh, issued uh, as a, in the form of a legislative proposal on the Hill. Others in the room, I think, uh, know more about that than I do on, the, uh, on that topic at this point. But in the paper, I recommended that the Obama administration uh, seek congressional authority for, for a single uh, pilot funding pool that would pool resources from state, DOD, and USAID in a way that would align train and equip programs uh, more closely with institutional building and human capacity development programs, and that would balance assistance appropriately among the elements of the security sector. Well, the fourth element that I uh, wanted to touch upon is the interagency structures. So to go along with flexible funding instruments, many donor governments have responded to today's challenges by creating hybrid structures that institutionalize uh, whole government approaches to SSR in, in wiring diagrams as well as in, in theory for uh, security sector reform, conflict prevention, and stabilization. These sorts of structures have been used to coordinate policy, uh, manage pooled funding mechanisms, as well as to support operations in the field. At the policy level, the SSR working group was, a, was one example of an interagency coordinating structure that originated you know, from the grassroots level. That work has been superseded by the Security Sector Assistance Interagency Policy Committee, which is a, a new, you know, more formal coordinating body uh, responsible for developing the Presidential Policy Directive on Security Sector Assistance. One of my recommendations was to make that permanent once the, uh, the PPD is actually released to continue to provide a forum for vetting and reviewing policy uh, decisions. Well, to manage the conflict pool in the UK, uh, the, the British government uh, and DFID, the Foreign Commonwealth Office and MOD have established a common governance structure that facilitates joint decisions on funding recommendations and uh, priorities. The conflict pool requires personnel from each agency to work together, sometimes on a single staff, and FCO and MOD actually assign individuals to form part of a DFID-led uh, virtual secretariat that uh, centrally oversees the pool. Um, I would uh, add as an aside that the, you know, the, the UK government has uh, recently completed a review of, uh, the, the new UK government has completed a review of, of uh, resources and, and budgets and uh, has actually decided to build up the conflict pool as, a, as an example of best practice within the, US, uh, within the UK government at a time when the rest of the government faces uh, major budget cuts. Uh, so to standardize multi-year planning and programming for security sector assistance as well as to manage the pooled account within the US government, I propose that an interagency security sector assistance plans and programs office 
be established within the State Department. But secondees representing their own departments and agencies, such as DOD, State, DOD, USAID, as well as Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. Many governments have also created structures to operationalize a deployable whole government capacity for SSR conflict prevention and stabilization in the field. Often, again, as is the case with the Stabilization Unit in the UK, a single organization does all of these things. So standing interagency units such as these actually help to institutionalize whole of government preparation and training, rapid response and unity of effort for these missions. The U.S. government has developed a standing deployable capacity for stabilization and reconstruction missions in recent years with the creation of SCRS, the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization at the State Department, and with the formation of the Civilian Response Corps, which is overseen by SCRS. I would argue, though, that SCRS is not really a whole of government organization in that it only has the civilian component. It's not a civil entity with only one DOD detail as a military advisor. SCRS, I think, also suffers from having limited SSR capacity. So my report recommends remodeling SCRS or a successor organization along the lines of the UK Stabilization Unit and making it a truly whole of government entity by integrating both active duty military and reserve military personnel, as well as individuals from the civilian expeditioning workforce in DOD, so DOD civilians as well as military folks. I also recommended expanding the reserve SSR capacity within the CRC to help develop and build that cadre. Well, the final area I wanted to highlight is in human capital, and that means human capital from the U.S. government. As SSR becomes more mainstreamed, greater professionalization will be required on the part of those who make policy and those who design programs. SSR work requires a mix of technical experts who, in such diverse areas as governance, policing, resource management, as well as generalists who are expert at integrating activities across a broad range of activities and navigating complex political and bureaucratic interests. So integrators of SSR strategies, programs, and activities also need grounding in concepts ranging from institution building to change management to strategic planning. Anybody who works in the SSR arena should have an appreciation for the country and regional context of the partner. So I recommended, as my final recommendation we'll talk about today, is the creation of a sub-IPC on training and education underneath the Security Sector Assistance IPC that would be focused on developing the U.S. government human capital of military and civilian officials at every level, including and maybe especially at the senior level, who are involved in making policy or designing programs related to a partner security sector. Well, I want to hear what the other panelists have to say, so I'm going to wrap it up there, but I'd be happy to go into more detail on specific findings or recommendations in the report after the discussion. But as we move on and move into the discussion period later, I'd welcome your perspectives on those elements that I talked about for a whole government approach. Are these the right ones? Did I miss any? What would you add or change? So with that, I will turn it back to Bob or go right to Karen. We'll go to Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And thanks to Bob and to USIP, both for hosting this event and for continuing to host events on security sector reform and to advancing the discussion uh, uh, on security and justice sector reform for so many years. Um, I always struggle when I'm asked to talk about security and justice sector reform uh, because I, I feel that it's hard these days to say something new. Um, I feel like we've been discussing some of the same issues for years, uh, for a very long time, we still struggle to achieve results on the ground. We're still not quite organized, as Greg just described. We're not organized in our in in the government um, and outside the government um, to implement an integrated approach. We haven't even fully adopted and internalized an integrated, comprehensive um, approach. Um, we still lack knowledge and capacities inside our own agencies in the U.S. government, um, and we still are talking about some of the same reforms that we were talking about 
you know, seven, eight, nine, and probably more years ago, more for, for a longer time than I've been around. Um, so when, I, when I'm asked to make remarks on, on these topics, I always struggle with something new to say. And unfortunately today, I, I'm not sure I'm going to uh, be able to say much that's new. Um, I'm also not sure I'm going to be able to go into too much detail because as, as um, you just heard, both the White House's IPC on security sector assistance is still going on, and the QDDR has not been uh, published yet. But we are all struggling very much with these issues. We're writing. We've got a lot of answers. There's still a lot of areas where we don't have answers. Um, I see many people in this room and, and uh, some on the panel who've been working on these issues for tirelessly um, for many years since I've, I've been around. And a lot of progress has actually been made. Um, so we're, we're coming to a growing consensus around the definitions, the principles, the approaches of how to do security sector assistance and reform. Um, there are more agencies engaged, which is both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, there's a greater understanding of, of what we need to do in the area of security sector reform. So it's great to see so many people here um, who are probably very knowledgeable and, and uh, skilled in this area. Um, I'll talk today about the QDDR, inc including where our analysis is and the experience of the process so far. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on what might be new, uh, might be new to some people but not so new to others. Um, first, the Secretary wanted the, the, the QDDR to address security sector reform because she's concerned about results, which we all are. Um, our inability so far to achieve results on the ground when it comes to strengthening security sectors. Um, and, and I get that I'm, I'm, I'm drawing generalizations and I know we do come up with some results sometimes and there is progress. But overall, many of our programs um, fail to come up with the results that we set out in the beginning, if we even define our objectives and results in the beginning. Um, so she wanted the QDDR to analyze. First, she wanted to understand why we've not been ach achieving results, um, but also then what we need to do to get results. Um, she views security sector assistance as one of our most critical tools um, in both ending violence, criminality, armed violence, um, strengthening fragile states, preventing conflict, as well as one of our core tools uh, in building stable societies with our developing partners. So it's, it's a core building block of, of basically all the nations where we provide assistance. Um, so basically she, and not just the secretary, but the, the uh, administrator, the secretary of state, and obviously the, the White House and the president increasingly um, understand the importance of, of our security sector assistance in achieving stability um, and more peaceful societies abroad. So it's become more of a priority um, and, and higher up on the agenda. So when we talk about results, that's a very hard discussion, as many of you know. Um, it's like pulling a thread from a sweater. Once you start to pull the thread, it just keeps coming longer and longer, and it starts to reveal just how much is entailed in us achieving results on the ground. So it starts, as, as Greg just described, all the way here uh, up at a headquarters level and how we organize, what you know, how we uh, conceptualize the discipline of security and justice sector reform um, have we collectively come to a common understanding of what that is among our agencies? Um, and I think there are very varying opinions on that, but there are people, I think it's making progress, there are people in both the IPC and QDDR who would say that yes, we, are, we have uh, come to more of a collective understanding within the U.S. government about it, what it is. Um, it's, so it starts up here. It, 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 it goes all the way down through a long chain um, of, of events, um, including things that we can't control, like the environment on the ground, the nature of our partners, whether or not we are wanted in a country or not. Um, so the least that we can do um, is get better at those areas that we have more control over, which comes to our own organization, comes to our own capacities, our own skills, our own operational solutions. And even then, 
once we perfect that, which I'm sure we will, um, we're going to have problems achieving results on the ground because that's, uh, that's the nature of, of this field. Um, one of the particular uh, discussions that we have inside the State Department um, with leadership there, again, as I mentioned, is about results. Um, we have so many conversations around how we organize, uh, how we organize, how we get our budgets, making sure that we can fund programs, how we get enough people out to the field. Um, we've got all these organizational and systems challenges, and we tend to spend less time and, and exert less effort, and I might be in trouble for saying this, but focusing on our practical techniques, our operational solutions, the methods that we use for delivering assistance. Um, I think we've barely scratched the surface of, of SSR as a practice. I think that's the whole international community. There's, there's a lot of progress and knowledge out there, a lot of efforts underway, um, but there's still a huge amount to learn. So even if we get it right in Washington um, and get accept the discipline, accept the definitions, get organized. I think we're still, uh, we have a long ways to go in terms of practical, operational, tactical solutions uh, on the ground. Uh, we need to move more towards an evidence-based, data-driven uh, approach where we are learning and feeding lessons back into our systems to improve our, our methods and our techniques. Um, again, a lot of people are doing a lot of great work around the world, and, and for me that seems more like an opportunity for learning. Um, we're not searching out or integrating lessons on, these, on operations uh, into our techniques so that we evolve how we actually deliver assistance, um, which ultimately feeds into how we train people, you know, the doctrine we build, the, um, the knowledge that we have collectively um, as practitioners of security sector reform. Um, we we need to uh, enhance that. So moving forward, again, and we, we talked, this is part of the QDDR discussion, part of um, some of the IPC discussions, but the desire to move more towards um, a, a, an evidence-based approach and develop more data on what works and what doesn't um, is, is on the agenda, and people are talking increasingly about it. Uh, we need more innovation in the field uh, when it comes to our to to our operations and our assistance delivery. Um, obviously, we need to get the basics right, which are you know, do we do training well enough? Do we do institution building well enough? Um, and those are sort of core functions um, across security sector reform, uh, and we need to get those right. But also, we need to begin doing more and trying more um, out in the field. So in the QDDR, our analysis flowed along pretty basic lines, um, starting from the, the core discussion of what is security sector assistance, what is security sector reform. Um, and as many of you know, we've all as a community been engaged in that discussion for a long time, and more and more people are joining the discussion. And again, back to the point that there's more of a sort of collective consensus, a collective understanding of what these terms mean, uh, which is great. Um, so what is SSR? What are our roles and missions? What are the capabilities we need to fulfill those roles? And what are the reforms we need to make internally to strengthen our capacity? So obviously, there's a, an interplay between the White House's IPC discussion, where they're looking at interagency-wise, as a, as a government, what are what is security sector assistance? What are the roles and missions of, of all of our agencies? Um, uh, and, and what are the capabilities we need collectively as a government? Um, the QDDR is a capability review, and so we looked internally. We looked at within the Department of State, within USAID, because it's a joint state aid undertaking. Um, we looked at our, our approach, first and foremost, and, and looked at how we define uh, and, and think about SSR, what do our programs look like, and a, a definition that the group came up with, the working group. Um, you know, there's a lot of t there was a lot of discussion of whether our programs actually reflect uh, these definitions, these principles. Um, and the answer was most of the time they don't. Um, 
a couple of things, again, that, that, that are a, a little bit new uh, in this area. Not, not, I can't go much into the QDDR. Um, I can say that there's nothing, nothing revolutionary in, in what we're talking about in the QDDR when it comes to security and, ju and justice sector assistance. Um, but it will be, I think, uh, it, it does confirm uh, and affirm what many of you work on, which is uh, um, many of you have been working on these topics for a long time. So, again, in terms of what's new, as I talked about before, there is a growing consensus, and you, send, and you, you feel this among different agencies um, around the definitions, principles, what it is, and that sounds like a basic thing, but it's pretty significant among multiple U.S. government agencies when you consider that six years ago when uh, I was the first senior rule of law coordinator in Iraq, um, I showed up and people didn't even know the term. The U.S. government representatives and, and practitioners on the ground, most of them didn't even know the term security sector reform. They didn't, a lot of them, some of them, didn't know the term rule of law. Um, in terms of, of, of definitions, practices, concepts, uh, so I, th I do think uh, that could either be a, a sign of the people that were there or it could be a sign of where we were in the evolution of, of these topics. Um, so there is a growing consensus. There are more people doing it, thinking about it, working on it, and that's a great thing that was very helpful to the QDDR. Um, I think a another important uh, um, positive thing that's new is not in the QDDR, but it's about... Uh, the, the atmosphere within which we are all working right now, which is a new, relatively new administration with a higher level commitment to an understanding of these topics um, than I've seen before. And so um, uh, that makes the environment for these issues, it makes it a lot easier to work on these. And, and in fact, it's, it's demanded from the very top levels um, of the government. So... Another, you know, interesting thing about this administration um, is a desire to uh, restore civilian leadership in security sector reform, um, and I think that's an important point. It comes along with a lot of uh, expectations about um, civilian agencies like State Department and USAID and Department of Justice and DHS all needing to get better um, at, at achieving results and delivering assistance. Um, which we're working on. Um, it's going to take time because of, of, as I mentioned before, we've been talking about a lot of these reforms for a long time. Um, and when it comes down to it, some of it's really just a change management exercise in our institutions um, to get us from here to there. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about the QDDR discussion uh, was that it was a state and U.S. aid discussion. And that it was valuable in that, as Julie Werbel can uh, attest, who participated uh, actually uh, very well in this exercise, uh, what it helped do was broaden the discussion um, of the group, which was a challenge. What you have is still, even though there's a growing consensus around these terms, you still have a lot of people who practice security sector assistance who don't quite understand the what it means to to do this under a rule of law framework or to root it in development principles or rule of law principles or governance principles. And so having USAID participation there um, contributed to that discussion, enriched the discussion in a way that, that uh, um, uh, we haven't had before. And I think the same thing is going on uh, within the IPC, although it is, it's a hard, uh, it's a hard process because what you have are a lot of agencies who've done primarily law enforcement, criminal justice types of activities. Um, that's the dominant voice that, that we have um, historically in the U.S. government. But you have more and more people coming to the table with knowledge about um, the broader, you know, viewing SSR as a governance endeavor. Um, we, without saying anything that interesting or, or detailed. We, we talk very much about, uh, about a whole of government approach and what our roles and responsibilities are in both shaping and leading and supporting a whole of government approach. 
um, uh, particularly at State Department, what is the responsibility of the Department of State um, to, to commit further to and to design a more whole of government approach, which um, although we've, many agencies, we've been moving more and more in that direction, it's been sort of ad hoc um, and people coming together trying to coordinate, but there really, as Greg mentioned, there's no structure, um, there, is, there is no leadership, structure, policies, common frameworks, um, common operational methodologies, and that's uh, something that we talked a lot about. Uh, and something that the leadership of the State Department is actually very committed to um, moving forward. And I'm going to, I think I only have a couple minutes. Is that right, Bob? Am I over? Probably, but that's I'm okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I'll talk about, you know, very quickly, I can, I can, uh, there were a lot of things that were not new. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we, we still, there were still some of the same discussions and arguments about what, what SSR is and isn't, who should be included, who not. You know, there are challenges with, with agencies who, who, you know, every agency brings their own uh, worldview and, and approach to the table. Um, what was great and, and, and uh, affirming was that the task force came up with basically the same list of reforms um, that have been in reports for many years, and so, uh, a as well as a few others. So um, we're, we are uh, sure what we need to reform, I think. Um, and an interesting, an interesting challenge remains in still having people discuss security sector reform, security sector assistance, in the same discussion as the rule of law discussion. So even to come together to be able to say, look, these are not the exact same things, but here they are, here is what they are, here's how they relate, here's where they're different, maybe like a Venn diagram approach. There's still just a reluctance to, uh, to do that among, uh, among U.S. government agencies. Uh, but, but to conclude, again, I think we are at, we have an opportunity um, where we are with this new administration. It's, it's, it's a great environment now for strengthening the U.S. government approach. Um, better than I've ever seen it. The administration that's committed at the highest levels, both the secretary and the president, um, as well as all of, uh, all of the senior officials involved. Um, uh, we have a growing consensus, as we've talked about. We have uh, more agencies than ever before working in, in, in this realm, which really is truly an opportunity, having DOD, DOJ, DHS, USAID, State Department, everyone brings a, a particular comparative advantage, um, resources, skills to the table, and it allows us to actually design truly comprehensive and scaled approaches um, that, that no agency or two agencies could do on their own. Um, and we have programs spread throughout the world. We're doing more and more places um, and therefore more, have more opportunities for learning. So to get better operationally, um, uh, it's, it's a time to, to start learning and to start improving our, our techniques on the ground. Um, and I'll end there. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Julie? Good morning. Thank you to USIP for, for hosting us, and thank you all for coming out particularly for a topic that I, uh, I believe is, was described as boring. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about narco-trafficking or illicit power structures or any of the more sexy parts of security sector reform, I'm happy to do that in, in the, the, the Q&A. Um, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than my counterparts uh, about the future of security sector reform and security sector assistance. Um, in part because of the presence of all of you here today. There's absolutely a groundswell of participation and interest in this topic in a way that I personally haven't seen um, over my career in, in working on security and justice issues. And I would say that this same uh, level of interest is mirrored within the government, whether it's in the QDDR or um, the Security Sector Assistance IPC. Um, so I'm going to talk today very briefly about um, the President's new development policy and its implications for security sector assistance and some of the work that we are doing in the, in the SSA IPC. And let me clarify first some terms. I know we've been throwing a lot out at you, security and justice, security sector reform, security sector assistance. Security sector reform is the term of art that describes a process that is homegrown and owned, by, owned and managed by a host nation. 
Security sector assistance is the universe of activities that the U.S. government brings to the table in support of that process. And as Greg pointed out, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation that the government does SSR and we provide SSA because a lot of our SSA may even be broader than that. It might include the building of coalition partners uh, for peacekeeping operations. For my military colleagues in the, ground, in the audience, it's not quite as large as security cooperation. So we're not talking about foreign military financing or the whole universe of what would be called security, sec security assistance. But this new term of art, security sector assistance, um, really is focused on building partner capacity. Um, so let me start uh, by talking about the global development policy. Let me start, if I may, with a quote from the White House, because it's a goodie. Um, Sustainable development is a long-term proposition, and progress depends importantly on the choices of political leaders and the quality of institutions in developing countries. Where leaders govern responsibly, set in place good policies, and make investments conducive to development, sustainable outcomes can be achieved. Where those conditions are absent, it's difficult to engineer sustained progress no matter how good our intentions or the extent of our engagement. Um, although the, the uh, development policy isn't primarily talking about SSR or SSA, I couldn't have written better guidelines myself to describe what we're trying to achieve and, and the conditions under which we must conduct uh, this activity. Um, and let me just take a moment to unpack the statement because I, I think there's, um, there's some good, good meat in here. First of all, SSR absolutely must be conceived of as a long-term process. And what that means from an SSA perspective is that we need to stop uh, planning to our budgets and start budgeting to our plans. And as anyone who's worked inside the government knows, this is a particularly challenging uh, endeavor. We also need to be honest about what we can achieve and in what time periods. It absolutely takes more than two years to build a new police force from scratch in a post-conflict environment. And we have to be <laughs> realistic about that. And we have to be able to inform our policymakers and our leaders and ambassadors on the ground who have political imperatives to, to show deliverables in a short-term period. That we as technical experts have to inform that, that uh, process. Secondly, leadership matters. We all talk about local ownership. But at the end of the day, local ownership is driven by leaders on the ground who have embraced, who understand, who are willing and able to manage the security sector reform process. All development is political, but no development is more political than development of the security sector. There are winners, there are losers, there are stakeholders, there's a reason that the status quo exists. And unbalancing those uh, very uh, sort of thorny and, and complex relationships takes a very strong leader um, that has some degree of legitimacy. Um, and they also need to be able to manage the fallout of these processes. Um, thirdly, governing responsible. At the end of the day, security sector reform is fundamentally about governance. It's the inclusion of governance in our discussion of these topics that changes your father's train and equip into a comprehensive, holistic process that's really designed uh, to leave in place sustainable change. Um, SSR defines not only what a, a partner security sector does, but how it does it. It's about transparency, accountability, responsiveness to the needs of the people, um, sound management. All of these things are integral to any form of development, whether it's economic development, education, uh, uh, human uh, uh, health, or security and justice reform. Finally, we need to recognize where these conditions are absent and make the right choices about building security capacity that won't endure or worse, that will actually undermine the, um, the governments that we're actually trying to empower. Let me switch gears and talk a little bit about the work that we're uh, um, trying to accomplish through the Interagency Policy Committee on Security Sector Assistance, the SSA IPC. Um, not surprisingly, the work plan looks very much like uh, Greg's paper, that we are, in fact, trying to tackle each of the issues that he's outlined, starting with national policy guidance. Uh, and as Karen mentioned, we have come to agreement on the basic principles, uh, on the basis approaches, on kind of the left and right boundaries of what we're talking about, um, and on national level guidance that will help uh, the different departments and contributing agencies prioritize what their engagements in this field should be. Um, our objective is to develop policy that's uh, focused and collaborative, uh, is um, built on a multi-year integrated interagency planning, offers increased flexibility, 
and integrate security sector assistance with other key uh, policy priorities. That is, uh, we, we have tended to treat it as an isolated line of, op, uh, of activity, and that the challenge for us all is to figure <coughs> out how to integrate these lines of activity in a way that we can achieve um, higher objectives. With respect to assessment, planning, programming, and evaluation, I would echo what Greg has said in that we have come a long way. We have a number of interagency tools that are um, being increasingly used in the field. The interagency security sector assessment framework is really a, a great start, and all of the, frame, the specific sectoral frameworks that nest within that are also being used increasingly by interagency audiences, or interagency teams, rather. The Maritime Security Sector Reform Guide um, which is finally out for clearance, will ultimately bear the seals of five different U.S. departments, state, defense, justice, DHS, and transportation, as well as USAID. Uh, and anyone who's worked in the interagency can't begin to, or can understand what a feat it is to try to get multiple clearances at once. Um, interagency structures. Having lived through and hopefully survived the QDDR process, <laughs> sorry, Karen, um, I can tell you that transforming any kind of internal structure or inter interagency process is complex. Um, but I think that there are still a lot of, of key questions that we, need to be, uh, that we need to be asking ourselves and grappling with a bit to answer. How much interagency is enough? At the end of the day, every department and agency maintains its original mandate. We all exist the way we exist for a reason. We were designed to fulfill certain objectives, whatever it is, whether it's USAID and our development objectives, whether it's DOJ and their um, justice and transnational crime uh, objectives. So how do we maintain and continue to achieve those objectives while we stand back and develop a more comprehensive um, set of goals, which may not actually be the same? Um, another question we need to ask ourselves is how much overlap is too much? If you were to ask every department um, sitting around the IPC how many of them work on rule of law issues, we would all raise our hands. Um, and I'm just, as an aside, I'd like to make a plea that we stop using the term rule of law to describe our activities and start using it to describe our outcomes. Because at the end of the day, as a term, it's almost lost its meaning because everything we do now falls under this umbrella of rule of law. If we are more specific about the kinds of justice sector engagements that we're undertaking, um, then I think it will be easier to identify where we're working together, where we might be working at cross purposes. Um, and again, I think that the, the overlap that we're experiencing is the natural result of the evolution of our different mandates over time. So when USAID began, it probably it included policing in its justice sector. After 660, uh, Section 660 was included, we excluded police. Um, when INO was created, they focused primarily on policing because they had a transnational crime, criminal uh, mandate. Over time, we've moved both towards the center because we've recognized the importance of whole of government approaches. We've recognized that you have to treat the criminal justice system as a system, and in order to do that, you have to engage with all of the actors. So we now increasingly find ourselves operating in the same space, but we came there honestly, and we still have different objectives. And so I think as a starting point, we have to all accept that some overlap is probably okay. Um, and there's, you know, the, the emphasis on streamlining and, and organizing, while important, may again undermine some of our other objectives, and we need to be clear um, that we have more than one policy objective as a, as a U.S. government <coughs> and that those mandates don't go away. I'm, I'm personally a bit bearish on the creation of new, um, of new structures for, for SSR because I think that organizational change often serves as a substitute for the, reti for the required sort of slog work, the administrative, the financial, the, the personnel systems. The real, you know, roll up your sleeves, dirty work of organizational change, change management isn't fun, it isn't pretty, it's not headlight grabbing, but it's absolutely required if you want to change your business models. And you can overlay a new business structure on top of that, but if you haven't dealt with these underlying issues, um, you're really going to find yourself in, in very much the same position with a whole other set of, of problems that you hadn't anticipated. And by the way, this is exactly the same advice that I give to my counterparts when I'm overseas working on organizational design in their countries as part of an SSR program, that you would never undertake this kind of program without thinking about building constituencies for change, identifying the stakeholders and the spoilers, thinking about the legitimacy of, of the 
the um, imperative, understanding where the resources will come from, thinking about the, um, the human resources impact and the financial impact and all of this sort of really unsexy kind of boring technical work that's required to get to an integrated approach. Uh, and while I'm not saying that there shouldn't be integrated structures to manage these things, I think that that has to be done very thoughtfully and in a way that takes into account why the, the level of coordination that we think is required for these kinds of activities doesn't exist now. Um, human capital. When, when announcing the global development policy, the USAID administrator recently said, at the end of the day, development is a discipline. It's a profession. And I think this statement really backs up Greg's point uh, regarding the need for human capital in security sector reform and security sector assistance who have the required experience, expertise, knowledge, and, uh, uh, and skills to do the job right. You can't take a cop off the streets of Albuquerque and send him to Afghanistan <laughs> and expect him to achieve the results that you're looking for. Um, it's and any more than you can accept, expect our ambassadors or our policymakers to understand the technicalities of this business without uh, exposing them to, real, to what's really involved. For those of us on the civilian side of security sector reform, we need to start treating this field like a discipline, and that means developing a professional development um, path and starting to educate our senior policymakers on what can and cannot be achieved through security sector assistance. And then finally, the flexible funding issue. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say that blood has been spilt over this, but I am going to suggest that it's a tricky issue. Um, for those of you who aren't as um, knee-deep in some of these uh, conversations, why flexible funding? In the beginning, Congress created foreign assistance, and it was good. <laughs> and over time, it was divided into military assistance and economic assistance. And you can't use military assistance for economic objectives, and you can't use economic assistance for military objectives. And while on the military side, uh, funds like SERP and some of the money for Pakistan really does enable them to engage in, in, a, more, in a broader environment, on the economic side, we really have stayed very true to that bright red line. Um, and so what that means on the ground is if you wanted to create a program where you engage the universe of actors within the security system of, you know, of both military, police, border security, it would be very difficult to do that with a single funding source. You'd really have to cobble from a number of different authorities to do it. On the, on the development side, we face this with respect to disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. And on this one, we're actually not alone. The UN faces a very similar problem. They, for their D&D, uh, &D, they used assess funds to the peacekeeping mission, but yet they have to create a trust fund for the reintegration components. We're in a very similar situation in the US because of this bifurcation of the funding, where from USAID's perspective, we can't get involved in the reintegration activities until those ex-combatants are certified as civilians, and so the use of our, um, of our assistance would be considered economic in nature. That makes it very difficult to engage early and high in the negotiation processes that determine what the plans will be for, uh, for a DDR program all overall. So um, there is some rationale for thinking through how we might update our authorities, how might we, we might create a, a joined up fund. The technicalities of it, however, are daunting. Uh, and where we are in this process um, is that whatever comes out of it will likely be a very small pilot that will require the concurrence of both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, and certainly um, all of the committee leaders on both the House and Senate side. And again, that's a whole other layer of complexity. We've so far focused on the executive branch, but when you talk about the number of committees on, on, on the Hill that would need to be involved in true interagency coordination between civil and military and in flexible fund, you're looking at eight different committees. Um, so that's a lot of coordination. Um, so let me just sum up by saying that, uh, again, I'm a little bit more optimistic. I think we've come a long way, baby. I think there's a long way still to go. Um, but the fact that you're all here and that you're taking an interest in this, again, admittedly boring topic, I see, um, I think is, is a really great sign, and I think um, we might just be on our way to some homegrown SSR after all. So thank you. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, um, 
My thanks to Bob Perito for inviting me uh, to serve as a discussant, or as it happens, the second discussant uh, of Bob's paper. Uh, but it means that unlike the other panelists, my status here is ascribed rather than earned, uh, and uh, perhaps, regrettably, unconstrained by any official boundaries. Uh, I will say that I never like to follow Julie Werbel because it's just hard to match her intellectual <coughs> data rate polished presentation and she's never boring. So um, that's my burden. Um, Greg has read, uh, written, uh, I think, a needed, informative, thoughtful, and well-informed paper written from the trenches, as it were, of the interagency. The sort of full and frank discussion, though, that when it's used to characterize a diplomatic presentation makes me try to remember where exactly I put that bomb shelter. Um, SSR mirrors many of the problems of democratic governance that, um, and especially uh, efforts by multiple democratic governments to do good and produce order uh, in the world, on the world stage. Uh, efforts that um, uh, may coincide, but they don't necessarily uh, do so. In other words, doing good and, and, and being effective. And uh, think about Spin Boldak and the border security situation there versus how it's done, for example. Um, so many of these problems of government uh, governance that we, uh, we seek to, uh, or, or solutions that we, we seek to spread around, we have uh, great big long-term complex problems <coughs> and little minds focused on short-term personal gain. And then there's government. Um, in recent meetings that I've attended, uh, from the most thoughtful people I've read or know, uh, the same themes emerge time and again. That here and abroad, we face problems that must be addressed for the good of the country and the good of humanity. Uh, but the political debate is like an old Monty Python sketch, right? We're driving toward a cliff. No, you're not. Uh, we need long-term funding. No, you don't. Um, and the whole of government, um, I will do the silly walk version of what Julie said. Uh, unfortunately, it reminds me of the Python department for stacking things on top of other things. <laughs> um, as we discover a new or common problem, everybody dives for it, collides with everybody else, and uh, whoever weighs the most survives the best. And in this case, it's usually DOD. Um, but while there are, uh, you know, there are efforts to uh, add order to the scrum as Greg ably lays them out, uh, the number of players doesn't change or it's growing, which Julie mentioned as a good thing and that may or may not be true depending on how nicely they're willing to play. Uh, and as she points out, the U.S. players, and as Greg points out, the U.S. players are only a fraction of the whole. Right? We can fight a way to get our own act together and we take it out on the road and we find out <coughs> we're on the wrong side of the road and somebody else's truck is coming. Um, There is also a prevailing background assumption that reforming countries' security and justice institutions, and there are um, many bureaucratic and philosophical fights over what this collection of activities or goals is or should be called, let alone try to achieve. Um, anyway, there's an underlying assumption that it's a good and necessary thing that could be made to work if we only were better organized and uh, better organized at doing it. And I think the deeper I get into the issues, the less sure I am of that argument. And from here, I want to just kind of go through points in Greg's paper, uh, skipping from, from, from place to place. Um, the note that, uh, uh, I want to note, SSR is not a thing or a specialty, really. It's an outcome or a goal, like rule of law. You want to end up with reformed institutions that are good at doing the objectives and the umbrella term tends to get reified, as many things do. Uh, or in the, the area that I work most, robust peacekeeping. Okay, that's been reified in UN doctrine. When we did the Brahimi report 10 years ago, we talked about robust rules of engagement that any complex operation should have to be able to defend itself, its mandate, the people it's supposed to protect. And that has now come to be a compound noun in a special class of operation, which I think is unfortunate. <coughs> where Greg talks about the need for um, 
as a goal, and I think citing probably the, the, the 3D paper, an effective and legitimate public service that is transparent, accountable to civilian authority, and responsible to the needs of the public. That's not the military, and it's probably definitely not the intelligence services. That applies more to criminal justice, to police, borders, maybe Coast Guard. Uh, I don't notice a whole lot of transparency with the military, and intelligence and transparency are kind of antonyms uh, in most settings. Um, okay. In considering the state of global, let alone U.S. cohesion and coherence on this subject, I'm really not sure whether to channel John Stewart, Glenn Beck, or Stephen Colbert, right? In other words, do I laugh? Do I cry? Uh, do I level withering sarcasm? Okay, it's a problem. Um, this country, you know, this country isn't just divided now. It's schizophrenic, and I'm, maybe I should emigrate to Hawaii. Wait. No, that's part of the country. Um, all right. Page eight. No existing government framework promotes planning for SSR as a generational endeavor. And I would say legally, probably it can't. Or it could, but it would be in trouble with its oversight committees on the, on the Hill. Um, no regional planning framework exists that integrates military and civilian efforts. And also true. And then think about what that would look like if we were really, really good at it. Uh, we would look like a uh, really imperial power. And this comes to where we, it comes back to the question of how consciously are we developing a national coordinated effort for these endeavors and it versus an internationally coordinated endeavor. And I think the fact that the SSR definitions and papers and the things that Greg wrote about <coughs> draw on the OECD handbook for security system reform is a good thing and it's a, a harbinger of, of better things to come but as we get ourselves revved up to do these things, let's make sure we're looking over our shoulders and, and consulting with uh, our partners uh, in uh, the donor community and our partners in the delivering uh, community. Um, to improve funding access, a growing number of governments, including those of the UK and Canada, have created flexible cross-departmental programming and budgeting instruments. And, and Julie, I think, very ably addressed some of the difficulties that we face governmentally here with doing something as flexible as, say, the conflict prevention pool in, in the UK, which I'm delighted to hear may be topped up uh, by the coalition government. But I also point out that those are also parliamentary systems. Okay, okay quasi now, coalitions in Australia and, and uh, maybe Canada and UK also, so uh, they may be sliding in our direction. But, um, but by and large, what the government wants to do and the parliament wants to do are mm -hmm. by definition the same, and you can move things ahead. And the UK had a three-year funding cycle. I don't know if that's the same, but with a three-year funding cycle, I mean, you know what you've got for three years. You can get a lot more done in terms of, of planning and, and accomplishing things on the ground that then contribute to consistency in your next three-year cycle. Um, Section 1207 expiring uh, on last Friday. Hmm? Last Moment Friday. of silence. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily bad, and and I'm wondering if the phone lines and the Twitter feeds between uh, state and the Pentagon have in fact been cut. You guys can probably still talk to each other. It's okay, even if 1207 is not there to provide a funding feed. Um, on um, the question of uh, a thing stacked on top of other things to run. Uh, SSR, uh, where would a U.S. stabilization unit sit? I think SCRS was an effort to create something like that within the State Department and all sorts of congressional problems and because, in part, because they didn't have a policy job and it took a long time to get going and to convince the Congress to give it money and now we've given it money and um, we're trying to figure out what to do with the, uh, the CRC and blend that into the much larger efforts like CEW that DOD has. Um, it could sit in the White House and the NSC complex, but the White House is very political. It's not career. Again, we have this problem how our government is structured versus how the professional civil services are structured with much less political penetration into the, the structures that endure between governments and elections. Put it in the interagency, kind of a twilight zone, really. 
uh, then I think DOD will dominate because they're the heaviest player in the scrum, right? And they always will be, I think, for the foreseeable future. And not only are they bigger, they got better night vision devices. Okay, so if you're operating in the twilight, DOD is just going to take it hands down. Um, State Department with secondees. I don't know. I might put it in USAID with DOD secondees. I mean, the, the breaking down some of the barriers between the two. I think we need to we need to slim down DOD. The secretary recognizes that, and we need to build up USAID, which I think is already in the game plan. But uh, that's the operational arm of U.S. foreign policy and assistance, and I think that's where the effort to bulk up really ought to be focused. And no, Julie did not pay me to say that. Um, a couple more observations. Um, on uh, page 10, in a time of severe resource constraints, no donor can hope to place technical experts for every conceivable requirement on the government payroll. And this, of course, is the CRC dilemma. And the irony is that there is a CRC reserve that is perfectly adapted to this that is the least favored by the Congress at the moment, right? What we don't so much need is a whole bunch of people with specialties that we're guessing about how they're going to be used, or we simply hire them and focus them on Iraq or <coughs> Afghanistan and our immediate needs. But what we really need to be able to do is to pull from lower levels of government, private sector, things and places that the federal government has nothing to do with in our governing structure, but has everything to do with building effective institutions on the ground. Educators in public administration schools, in, in, in companies that specialize in public administration, these are the places we should be drawing our, our personnel. And, okay, severe funding constraints, but somehow $700 billion a year into the defense budget. <coughs> yeah. um, the PPD should balance capacity building with reform. Yes. Uh, just made the point about the educators. And more broadly, um, teach reading. And I say reading broadly to, you know, 8- to 10-year-olds uh, everywhere we deploy this instrument. Make sure the literacy rate is... Is, is brought up as soon as we land on the ground. If we had done this 10 years ago in Afghanistan, we'd have a whole generation, even if it's just for the boys, okay, sorry, I mean, even if, even if just for the boys, we'd have a whole generation, a whole cohort of 8 to 20-year-olds who were literate and could be trainable as cops and junior public administrators and all sorts of things. Instead, not so much. So we look at the long term and start it in the short term. And being able to read is so fundamental that the uh, NATO training command has finally gotten that, but only last year. Right? They just started training their cops to read. I guess the, the gentleman who runs Spin Boldak doesn't read. He's doing fine, but I don't really, really want to know what he does to keep the relentless pursuit of the Taliban underway. Um, Assessment should include a frank analysis of a partner's political will to transform its security sector. Uh, yes. Um, just noting that SSR, and Julie also covered this better than I will, but I'll do it anyway, may have many, many partners locally and internationally. Um, and they're all going to have uh, different levels of will and resources and goals. And... Uh, the scrum that I mentioned up front is both local and international, and occasionally the scrums merge. Um, when the local scrum is smaller or its order is, order is brought to it before order is brought to the international scrum, then the host state is going to be playing all of us like a violin all right, or a uh, ukulele or whatever. Um, and they will cherry-pick aid and cherry-pick objectives, and then you have to think about well, we're talking about all of this effort, and let me just leave you with this thought. Uh, all of this effort to conf uh, both get our own act together and then, as I said, conform with our international, which by which I meant Western partners, OECD partners, who buy into international human rights law, international uh, humanitarian law, uh, democratic governance, and then there's China. Right? And China comes cruising in with... Um, uh, all of its trade surplus dollars, and they can invest them or uh, hand them out in packets of unmarked bills uh, with no strings attached, right? And for governments that aren't especially democratic to start with, this is very handy, okay? And so this is something else that we need to compete with as we develop all of these tools for creating good governments and so forth, and taking several years to do it, and they're out there just moving on, okay? Um, 
I'll stop there because I hate to end on an up note. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for an interesting and engaging uh, evaluation. Um, I'd like to thank all the members of the panel for really very substantive and, and very informative presentations. And I'd like to begin by um, exercising my prerogative of the chair here to ask the first question. Um, I think maybe the question that was on the minds of many this morning when they showed up is the burning question of when. Uh, we have two government insiders and two people that are outside looking in. And I want to ask the question that's on most people's minds these days is we have all of this process that's been going on for a very long time. When are we going to see the results? When are these two remaining reports going to appear? We'll start with Greg. What do you think? I'm one of those outsiders now. So I What's your best guess? Speculate. Come on, you have to you have to you have to make a guess. <laughs> uh, I would yes, guess Greg. that the QDR yes. would be uh, released perhaps mid November. I don't know. Uh, well, let Karen uh, comment on that. And I really can't say about the security sector assistance IPC because every time it gets traction, it gets derailed by budgetary and legislative cycles um, that happened last December with an existential question about what are we going to do with 1206 and 1207? Are they going to state or are they going to stay at DOD? Uh, and that same dynamic has happened with this uh, discussion on pooled funding from what I understand. It's kind of taken the, the, the wind out of the, the PPD process, but that's an outsider's view. Uh, others may have better insight information. Karen, what do you think on that? On the IPC? On the IPC, but also QDDR, what's your, what's your best guess? Um, I, so I would agree with Greg first on the IPC process. So we, even those of us who work on it uh, at various levels are, you know, it's a, it is, the timing is difficult given how, how many issues come up and, and how uh, important all of them are. Um, so that's a little bit harder to predict. The QDDR, as the Secretary announced, um, a week ago, it will come out within 30 to 60 days. So that's that's when it will come out. I can tell you that um, our biggest challenge at this point is the review <coughs> process that it has to go through. So we have a you know a first draft of the report. We um, we the the process for these quadrennial reviews, including the QDR, the QHSR the quicker, um, and others, they, they all go through an interagency review process, which is actually a very, very difficult but very uh, important and useful process. Um, so we do engage with other agencies to some extent during the process, but um, this is really a time for us to, to, to in, have other agencies look at what uh, we've written and weigh in. So that... I think it took the QDR about six weeks to get through that. Anyone know the exact answer to that? It, it will take us less time, I hope. Julie, how does it look from the other end of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue? Were you just collecting bids here and then we'll <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we betting? Yeah. Um, I won't speak to the QDR. Uh, on the IPC, we are very much hoping to have something by the beginning of the year. But, mm -hmm. uh, but again, we have been um, sidetracked by a number of very important debates that that really needed us to focus on them. So, you want to guess? What do you hear, Bill? <laughs> I, nothing. I know nothing. I know nothing. But we'll all have to walk. Well, it'll be like the Ministry of Silly Walks when we come to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, since Bill started talking, I've been wondering, you know, anybody that tunes into this on the web is thinking they've stumbled into the Bill Maher show or the Daily <laughs> Hour or something, you know, it's like, all right, anyway, let's go back to being serious here. We'll open the floor for questions. We'll ask uh, people who want to ask questions if they would go to the microphone so we can capture their questions uh, for the, those that are watching outside this room. Um, and uh, what I'd like you to do is, um, in the usual format, is state your name and your organization and then ask your question. Uh, good morning, how are you this morning? <laughs> nice to see you. Good morning, I'm uh, Dawood Yaqub. I'm currently with Princeton University. Uh, prior to that, I was the security sector reform coordinator for the government of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, as all the panelists uh, pointed out, uh, the SSR involves uh, transformations um, 
on the ground in <coughs> recipient countries. Uh, and as um, uh, Julie pointed out, it actually gives donors entry into some very contentious uh, space in uh, post-conflict transition. In some levels, it creates winners and losers on the ground. It shifts uh, the balances of power. Uh, my first question is, do we really have the skill sets to engage in those type of activities that ends up shifting the balances of power locally and what consequences may flow from that? And associated to that, how do you reconcile that with the concept of local ownership? Do we simply pass by? Uh, do we sideline local actors or simply overlook them? Okay. Um, somebody want to take a shot at that? Greg? Um, sure. I, uh, to your first question, do we have the skill sets to um, you know, help navigate those shifts in balance of power or uh, realigning uh, uh, political you know, power within a country? I, mean, I think uh, I, I would argue that you know, in the U.S. government, there are people with skills to um, to help make determined uh, decisions or inform decisions on likely outcomes. That, you know, strategic planners, but uh, I would say that those individuals are fairly rare. We often you know, <coughs> go into programming and, and launch activities without that sort of upfront uh, work being done. That's that's you know, where the assessment is so so critically important. Yet. Uh, seldom, seldom accomplished along the lines that you described. So I think part of our record uh, in you know, security sector reform uh, from uh, in, in assistance from the U.S. government um, has been mixed, and some of the failures uh, have been attributed because or by, to the fact that we haven't done that upfront work. We uh, haven't done a very good job of that. So. I would say yes, there are people with those skill sets, but we need more of them. We need more training, like Julie talked about. Uh, you know, we need to professionalize this as a as a discipline, so that you know, there's a greater cadre of people that can navigate those sorts of issues. Um, and how do we address local ownership? I mean, that, that's the that's the uh, paramount uh, uh, you know principle, I think, of uh, of SSR. And you know, my my paper is totally. Uh, focused on a kind of a Washington-based, donor-based process, with the end being working with the, you know, uh, making the U.S. Uh, government a, a more effective partner for for local governments and uh, uh, local stakeholders, and helping develop and manage processes of transformation in their security sectors. So, Julie, others. Um. I think the points that you raise really suggest that SSR is as much an art as it is a science, and that the, the kind of personnel who are particularly adept at this are people who really can stand back and understand the political dynamics in play, and who are able to do a stakeholder analysis up front, and who sort of bring <coughs> to the process that almost that je ne sais quoi that makes a good development worker a good development worker, or a good mentor, or an advisor. Um, and that's not always trainable. I think you can train the skills. Um, you can create managers. Can you create leaders? I mean, I think it's that same that same dynamic. And so we just have to look out for the people who bring that uh, inherent understanding to the process. Local ownership, I think, is one of the, the – it's this great buzz phrase that we all use, but nobody can really define. Who's the local who owns it? I did an assessment um, several years ago in, in Pakistan, and I always come back to this because for me it was one of the, the more instructive moments in, in my career where I was uh, trying to, to develop a National Security Council in, in, to help rebalance civil-military relations under the, the previous regime. And when you talk to the senior leaders in the country at the national level, their identification of threats and priorities was – everything you would imagine, and largely related to India. When you talk to the everyday Pakistani on the street, the number one security threat that they identified to me was cattle theft. You, that's night and day, you know, and so how do we, in the provision of security sector assistance in a way that promotes local ownership, whose ownership is it anyway? Um, and I, I think there's there are multiple layers to that, and, and uh, again, these are the this is what makes it the art. Um, but there is a way to mentor and advise and provide technical assistance that does ensure that you're um, at, at least building on locally identified priorities. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons I think where development brings, or that's one of the areas in which development, traditional development work really does bring something to the security world. Um, because when you add things like um, town hall meetings and public debates and public discussions about how the entire population would identify its security needs and its justice needs, that does help inform um, what the programs look like in the end. Please, next question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Scott Stedgen with Oxfam. Um, I want to go to the, the, the issue of the political will of the, of the government receiving the assistance. And all of you have mentioned that if, if the government is, does not have the political will for a reform, we're going to have a difficult time actually engaging in this process. Um, I'm thinking, of, I mean, as Oxfam, we've, we've been doing a bunch of research in the DRC on this issue. And the DRC is a clear example where um, throughout its history, um, the, the president did not want to have a strong security sector because they're worried about coups. Um, so they're always resisting having professionalization of the FARDC. Um, so the U.S. is throwing is, is is supporting this, but we know we can't go so we can't go so far without the political world changing. But are we throwing good money after bad in those types of situations, and should we be stopping it? Understanding that if we do stop it, we lose leverage with the government to actually change their political calculations. It's a real dilemma here that that I think um, the U.S. government needs to deal with, and I was wondering if you had any insights from the review process, if you, how you dealt with that. Can you go? Uh, sure. Um, you give me the easy question. That's good. Um, I mean, this, this points to a particular issue within the field about the difference between just being a t sort of technical uh, capacity builder versus bringing together all the tools um, that, you, that, that we have at our disposal to the table to both affect pol political will um, uh, and build local capacity. So obviously we operate in a lot of environments where we struggle not just with where there is no political will but also with a, a will and an int intention that looks different than ours. And so, um, you know, sometimes we do need to ask the question, should we be even be operating now at this time in this country with these objectives that we have? But at the same time, if it's a, if it, is a priority for us, um, there are multiple tools that exist to help impact political will. There are, you know, the incentives and disincentives, not just that the U.S. government can provide, but the international community um, points to the importance of, of leveraging, you know, diplomatic influence and pressure, regional partners, their influence and pressure, um, and, and, and it's a whole Again, uh, it, there is an art also, not just to building capacity, but to um, to influencing and affecting political will. Please, Bill. Yeah, just briefly. Um, question might be, why does the DRC need an army? Right. Um, if the neighbors' uh, hands can be pried off of DRC minerals and minerals brought under legitimate control and producing revenue for the government and and have their own security and have a border police force, have a professionally trained presidential guard if the president's nervous, um, good enough to protect him, not enough to run the rest of the country. Um, it needs a large police capacity, and I believe the UN was recently given a mandate by the Security Council to train 22 battalions of police. Well, let's give them a hand at doing that, because I think that's the transformation they need to make. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Victoria. Hello, Victoria Staddle, Lieutenant Commander in the Navy. Um, I just returned from Afghanistan six weeks ago, working with the Afghan National Police at NTMA headquarters, uh, specifically on the training development of the curriculum as we were taking the program over from INL. So I worked with the police from Albuquerque. I also worked with the French, the Germans, the Italians, and everybody else had their hand in our pot. Um, the comments about literacy and, and the incorporation into that our, into our training was something that was near and dear to my personal heart because I do believe that it's vital. However, what I found was that decisions were made based on questions that came back from DC, i.e., how many are you training, how quickly are you training them, and when will they get on the ground? So my question is, when we know that uh, we would like in 10 years to have that eight-year-old be literate, how do we get the qu right questions asked back in the field to make sure that the motivation is focused in that direction of our long-term sort of strategic goals from 
from back here versus the short-term effects, and how do we do that while balancing not looking like an imperial power? Thanks very much. That's a, that's a good question. I only want to point out that that's a question we've been dealing with in this business going back into the, into the days when we were in the Balkans. And, uh, you know, as somebody who used to run the international training program at the Department of Justice, um, when we went into both uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, those same people were there asking, you know, how fast can you put boots on the ground, um, even though those boots will be uh, worn by people who have no idea what they're supposed to do. Uh, and so it, it just it just never never changes. And uh, you know I'm, I'm sure you had to live with this as well. But you know in in Afghanistan we had an eight week training program, which in order to speed up the number of boots that we're going to put on the ground, we just qu cut to six. Um, and we're trying to grow the program by twenty or thirty thousand this year. Um, so you know all of that leads to chaos and confusion. But um, anyway, anybody else want to take a shot at that? Well, I would just uh, suggest that, you know, that highlights imp the importance of uh, evaluation. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, the, the metrics and measures of impact and effectiveness that, um, you know, reported back to Washington if, if they're done in a, you know, thorough sort of way and, and look at the qualitative factors versus just the quantitative, you know, outputs of, you know, number of police trained, number of uniforms provided, et cetera, uh, would help to highlight uh, the fact that you know, maybe our training is not as effective as it could be because we're dealing with a largely illiterate uh, population, and that you know, feeding back into our you know, whole government sense into our uh, USAID you know, education uh, programs in that country. I mean, that's I don't have any better you know, recommendations than that. But I mean, that, you know, again, that just uh, that points out the fact that evaluation is so important, and we really do a poor job of it. If we have a break in the number of people who are, oh, please, go ahead. My name is Liz Panarelli. I work here at the U.S. Institute of Peace and support the security sector governance program. Thank you all so much for your presentations. I found them very interesting. And I was wondering if you could go into a little more depth, um, whoever would like to address this, about security sector assistance as a tool for conflict prevention. Um, we mostly deal with it in a, a post-conflict or stability operations context, um, but I think a lot of the literature and interest is moving towards uh, conflict prevention, particularly when you have a strong sort of demand-driven approach, uh, local ownership, et cetera. So if you could please speak to that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks very much, Julie. That sounds like it's for you. Um, what's funny about this question to me is that um, I actually work in the Office of Democracy and Governance, and everyone in the U.S. and in, in USA thinks that I work in the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation <laughs> because they automatically tie security and conflict together. Um, and I think there are obviously a lot of good, good, very good reasons for that. And I think SSR is absolutely a tool for conflict prevention, um, particularly when you start looking at the reasons why conflict happens. Um, and it's, you know, in many cases it's because it's often driven by or exacerbated by bloated, politicized, you know, um, sort of unprofessional security services that are not doing their jobs and that are preying on the population and either creating or inflaming uh, existing tensions on the ground. Um, I think that as in the, U as in the U.S., the security sector can play a very important role um, in the democratization of a, of a country and in so doing um, also influence how, um, how conflicts are managed and handled. Um, certainly in our own country, um, the military has been far ahead of the rest of, of the society or at least been the lead in terms of integration uh, and, and um, that's one of the issues that we look at in security sector reform is how ethnically integrated are the security services, um, at what levels and what percentages, those sorts of things. So um, I think in, in, you know, there are sort of multiple ways. When you look at um, the cycle of conflict, one of the challenges is that conflict begets conflict. Um, and so countries emerging from conflict are ten times more likely to re-engage or fall back onto, uh, into that process. And so effective SSR, even in a post-conflict period, is also done with prevention in mind. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why we need to get much better at linking SSR and DDR. Um, that again, reintegration is often thought of as the afterthought. It's not well funded, it's not well thought through. And yet, if those ex-combatants are not really associated back into society, they, they then become the threat um, that reignites conflict in, uh, you know, in the next phase. So I, the thing about conflict prevention is that it, it's never a, a linear cycle. It's more a cyclical one. Um, and so at any stage of the game, you're preventing and responding to conflict. Karen, you want to join? Um, I have little to add to that, just uh, picking on the point that the prevention is, it's a continuum or it's a cycle. And so at every phase <laughs> when it might we are both reacting uh, and responding. We are also, uh, we need to approach these things with a prevention lens uh, in mind. So it looks like we practice this mostly in post-conflict in a reactionary mode. Um, and I think historically we have. And I think it's, it's symbolic generally of, of how we approach conflict and crisis, which is not from a preventative um, perspective, except in this sense that as civilian institutions, we generally uh, believe that our development assistance is conflict prevention. Um, and and uh, what we're, we're not particularly seized by conflict prevention as, as an imperative, um, uh, even though it's sort of one of the best modes of cost avoidance, um, it's, it's the most humane uh, approach um, that we could take, but I think I think we're moving in this direction. I think that we, that just having you know everyone in this room and elsewhere understanding uh, just the practice of security and justice sector reform, if done right, it is a preventative. Uh, um, it's a preventative approach, and so it's a critical tool in helping us actively prevent, uh, not just helping us, but actually helping local um, countries and regions prevent their own conflicts. Thank you. I think what we'll do since we're almost out of time is we'll ask uh, both of our questioners to ask their questions and then we'll give the panel one last chance to respond to the questions and make any kind of closing remarks they would wish to make. Please. Monique Beadle with Falling with Souls. We're a grassroots campaign for peace in DRC. I'd like to see clarification of a comment made by uh, Mr. Dirch. Um, it seemed to imply that the U.S.'s action on conflict minerals in DRC could substitute for better engagement in security sector reform. I just returned from a Nairobi where I spent last week at the OECD ICGLR joint consultation on the legal exploitation of natural resources. And I can't speak for every NGO or, or CSO that was in the room, but um, the consensus I picked up on, at least among Congolese civil society organizations, is that these regional and national and local attempts to investigate origins of, of minerals and to certify supply chains were going to be wholly ineffective and, in fact, impossible to implement without corresponding security sector reform. Um, the reality is that 12 years ago, DRC was invaded by all of its neighboring countries. Um, the, the army is 130,000 strong, and there are 70 million civilians. Um, I think, arguably, eventually there is a need for an army and that it does need to be reformed um, and that there are some critical and easy to address differences between an army that protects civilians and an army that preys on civilians. So I just wanted to seek some clarification on the what you see as the interplay or the, the um, disconnect between, you know, regulating natural resources and, and involvement of the security sector. Thank you. Brian Burton from CNAS. Um, I just wanted to ask one, one reform measure that's going on right now is that there's a DOD security cooperation review that's currently ongoing that, from what I can tell, is pretty heavily focused on um, making security assistance more responsive and uh, really focused on, on delivery <coughs> rather than some of the more holistic uh, things that, that we've discussed here today. So I was just wondering, um, you know, for many of you who have experience with it, you know, how well is, is that process being coordinated with the processes that you described today? Uh, and, you know, to the extent to which it is or is not, what are the implications for sort of the whole of government uh, approach to security sector reform? Thank you for the question. Um, I think <coughs> we'll have the panel uh, answer uh, these final two questions and make their closing statements in reverse order. And we'll start with Bill Dirch. 
Thank you. Uh, to address the penultimate question, um, not saying that there shouldn't be a substantial security sector reform program and, and, and build up of security sector capacity that's professional and so forth in Congo, <laughs> only that um, the Army is probably not where you want to start. I think I tend to su uh, subscribe to Henri Bosoff's uh, uh, position. He, he's at uh, the Institute for Security Studies or Strategic Studies in, in Pretoria, spends a lot of time in Eastern DRC. And he thinks that the entire army should be barracked because it's, it's, un, it's an unvetted amalgam of old government forces, old rebel forces, untrained, unvetted, um, uh, you know, some of Nkunda's people, um, some maybe, God knows, even FDLR people in there, some ex Mai Mai, and then just shoved together, and then they go and find their own food and sustenance, and they're part of the problem. And that what Congo really needs is a professional police force, not an army per se, because its problems are 99% internal security, and we don't want to go about reinforcing the notion that armies are about internal security, right? It's simply in, in, inconsistent with civilian control of the military and the whole risk of the government worrying about coups and so forth. But police is part of security sector reform, justice, corrections, all part of security sector reform. Um, Yes, you're not going to get anywhere just on uh, on uh, an externally run uh, conflict minerals program, but you do have to get control of the sources of mineral production. You have to get honest companies doing that. You have to have honest and effective security protecting them and, and protecting the supply chain and the chain of payments, uh, both for the minerals and for the taxes. Um, all of that needs to be done. I can see all of it as part of, of a, a larger security sector uh, reform effort. It's a huge country, uh, and we should have been doing this 10 or 15 years ago. Thank you. Julie? Um, I would actually echo that. I think when we think about um, um, sort of natural mineral and, and other kinds of um, both exploitation and trafficking, the first responders are actually internal security and border security. And if you look across Africa, whether you're talking about narco trafficking now that's coming in from Latin America, the ability of most African governments at the national level or at the regional level um, to maintain the level of border security both on land and at sea um, to really engage effectively with these threats is, is minimal. Um, so I, I would echo that. On the um, security cooperation review, uh, one of the benefits uh, to having DOD at the table is that we ha where they are represented by um, both the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff on the SSA IPC, so they can bring to bear um, the results of these reviews that are going on. But I would also um, just suggest that the DO Department of Defense is pretty big and that they are a learning organization, and they spend a fair amount of time reviewing what they've done and planning what they're uh, going to do. And so um, to be able to coordinate, for example, every theater security cooperation um, meeting with what's going on at, at the IPC would probably be a bridge too far, but certainly um, the fact that there are these two belly buttons that can reach back to the whole agency, and the, you know, the deputy secretary has certainly also been involved in the process, so uh, they are pretty linked up. Yeah, Karen. You know, I really have nothing to add to those two questions, to the, to the answers, so I'm going to pass it to Greg if you'd like to. On the uh, latter question, uh, the Security Cooperation Reform Task Force was uh, created uh, to implement the recommendations in the QDR. There's a reforming security assistance chapter in the, in the QDR. So like the QDDR, it was an internally focused effort primarily on improving internal uh, DOD systems and processes especially with the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and the military departments, and uh, being more effective and efficient in uh, providing, you know, equipment and, and training uh, for, uh, for our security assistance programs. It's led, I think, by a lot of the same people that are involved in the SSAIPC, so it, it is uh, fairly well linked up, but, uh, but it's, it's primarily an internal process that aligns with the you know, the whole of government process to We never get away up. with saying that. <laughs> <laughs> with the QDDR? I mean, generally, it's the, 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 the point that it's an internal process, particularly on uh, subject matters that we are all promoting should be whole of government, um, it's hard to do, as I'm learning, an internal review and process that, that is not 
fully accompanied by, at some point, by uh, a more inclusive, collaborative effort. Well, I, uh, I'm not currently involved in it, but I'm, I would say that it's it's the internal uh, piece of the SSAIPC. So there's a lot of internal uh, house cleaning that needs to go on within DOD on you know str uh, cutting down delivery mm -hmm. timelines uh, for ac acquiring weapons and uh, you know, providing you know, transporting them to the recipient countries. I'm sure if state and NAID had extra capacity, they, their help would be welcome on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cruel. And so we've managed to. <laughs> so I, I, I think Julie needs another task force and working group to participate. I, that's, that's, that's where I'll put you all to work. Anyway, we've managed after two hours to close at a point of controversy. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all again for, for being with us this morning. I'd like to uh, invite an expression of appreciation for our panel. Thank you.